So this is our first video for Chemistry 2, and it's basically about intermolecular forces. So we have to first distinguish between intramolecular forces and intermolecular forces. Okay, so the intramolecular forces are those that occur within a molecule. In other words, Covalent bonding, or the bonding between the atoms in a molecule. This was covered in Chem 1, probably towards the end of Chem 1, where you started talking about covalent bonding and shapes of molecules and so forth. And then you have intermolecular forces, okay? And these are the forces that occur between molecules. And basically, this is going to be our, pri our primary focus in this chapter, intermolecular forces, one more time, forces that, are forces that occur between molecules. So, the type of intermolecular forces depend upon polarity, okay? And covalent molecules can be described as polar or nonpolar. So we have to first talk about how you'd be able to tell the difference between a polar versus a nonpolar molecule. So I'm going to go over this a little bit on pre predicting molecular polarity, but this is really a separate topic and I have another video for this. I'm going to go through and hit the highlights here. All right, so how do you predict whether a molecule is polar or not? Okay, first of all, any homonuclear diatomic molecules are always nonpolar. Right, so N2, O2, F2, H2, those are always going to be nonpolar, right? Because what makes a molecule polar is an uneven distribution of electrons. Well, if the two atoms are the same, let's say you have an NN bond or an OO bond, or an FF bond, the two bonded atoms are the same. So we, we can't say, for example, that this fluorine atom is any different than this one. Okay, so the bonding, bonding electrons will be shared equally. That's what makes it nonpolar. Okay, heteronuclear diatomic molecules are always polar. Okay, so diatomic is two atoms, but hetero means different. So the two bonded atoms are different. HF, HCl, HBr, Co. So let's say, for example, if you have an H bonded to an F like this, that's very different than an F bonded to an F or an H bonded to an H because the two bonded atoms are different. And what happens is that, that electron pair is not shared evenly. Okay, electrons spend more time with the fluorine because the fluorine is more electronegative. So you wind up with a negative, partial negative charge on the fluorine and a partial positive charge on the hydrogen. The bonding electron pair is not shared evenly. All right. So a molecule with two or more atoms about some central atom is nonpolar only if the atoms are distributed symmetrically. So we got two examples here. If you look at carbon dioxide, okay, you have a carbon that's bonded to an oxygen that's bonded to an oxygen, okay. Well, the symmetry of this molecule is linear. And if you had carbon monoxide, all right, if you had just an isolated CO, then it would be polar. But this is nonpolar because it's symmetrical, that this oxygen is pulling electrons this way. Oxygen, oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. So this oxygen is pulling electrons this way, and this one is pulling it this way, and that pull because this is linear, 180 degrees apart, those poles balance each other out. Whereas if you look at water, we're going to talk about water in detail, 
if we look at water, the shape of water is angular or bent, okay? And so this is going to be polar because it's not because it's not symmetrical. You wind up with the partial negative charges on the oxygen and partial positives on the hydrogen. Okay. So the electron pull is not balanced out. Right. So a molecule with a single unshared electron pair is always polar. Okay. NH3, SF4, Br85, right? If you go back and look at the VS EPR shapes of these molecules, or of the description of these molecules, they all have an unshared one unshared electron pair. Okay, so for example, ammonia has that one lone pair on the nitrogen. That's a shape that we described as trigonal pyramidal, but that has one unshared electron pair on it. It's always going to be polar because there's nothing to balance out the one unshared pair. Okay, so any molecule with one unshared electron pair is always polar. Fifth rule is a molecule with more than one unshared pair can be polar if the electron pairs are symmetrical. So it all depends on if you have a symmetrical distribution of the electron pair. So if you look at something like XEF2, it has three unshared pairs that are 120 degrees apart. The unshared pairs occupy the equatorial positions that leaves the two actual atoms. It's nonpolar. On the other hand, if you look at BRCL3, we have two unshared pairs, and they're 120 degrees apart, which is not balanced. Okay, so it's unsymmetrical, and the molecule is polar. So, why are we talking about polarity? Because we said we want to talk about intermolecular forces, and the strength and the, and the type of intermolecular forces that you can have depends upon whether your substance is polar or not, okay? So let's talk about these types of intermolecular forces. First, ion dipole forces, okay? And so this is exactly what it sounds like. It's a force of attraction between an ion and a dipole, okay? So it's a force of attraction between an ion and a dipole, which of course begs the question, what's a dipole? Dipole is a, a partial negative, negative, positive or negative charge on a polar molecule. Okay, so example. An example is salt dissolved up in water. Now, you may rec recall from Chem 1 what happens to ionic compounds when they dissolve up in water? They dissociate, right? You, if you add salt to water, the salt disappears. What happens to it? That crystal lattice comes apart, and the salt dissociates into separated sodium ions and chloride ions. And that's how it exists in solution. Okay, now what we said earlier about water, we said water is polar. This is where polarity becomes important. We said water is, is a polar solvent. Okay, meaning that you have, meaning that the electrons are unevenly shared and you have these partial charges. Partial negative on the oxygen, partial positive on the hydrogen. Okay, well, there's forces of attraction. There's forces of attraction between opposite charges, even partial charges. Okay, so let's say the salt goes into water and the salt dissociates into the separated sodium and chloride ions. So now we have these, these 
charges floating around in solution, and these are full charges, and then we have the partial charges. Well, there's force of attraction between the opposite charge. So let's say we have some chloride ion floating around out here in solution, then that negative charge is attracted to that positive charge. You have a force of attraction there. Or if you have a and you have a positive charge on the sodium, that would be attracted to the negative charge on the oxygen. So basically, the the these ions become what we call solvated. Okay, the ions become solvated. The water molecules basically go in and sort of attach to the ions. The oxygen, the negative on the oxygen to the positive on the sodium, and the positive on the hydrogen to the negative on the chloride. Sodium ions attracted to the partial negative charges on the oxygen and chloride ions attracted to the partial positive charges on the hydrogen. Okay. So second, let's look at dipole dipole forces. Okay, so this is again, this is exactly what it sounds like. It's a force of attraction between partial charges in polar molecules. And, and we'll talk more about this later. And I hate to use water as an example because we'll use that for hydrogen bonding. But um, water is an example that if you have two, two, if you have two separate, let's say we have two separate water molecules. Let's say we have one here. Okay, we have one here, say we have one here and one here. Right, well we have partial, partial, one more time, partial negative charges on the oxygen, partial positives on the hydrogen. Right, so positive charge here, negative charge here, there's a force of attraction. There's a force of attraction between the positive charge here and the negative charge here. In other words, the molecules stick together. That's dipole-dipole forces. Force of attraction between a dipole and a dipole. And of course, for you to have dipole-dipole forces, it has to be a polar molecule. Can't be a nonpolar molecule. It has to be polar. Okay. Um, London dispersion forces. Okay, now so what are these? Basically these come about because at any given moment in time you may not have an uneven distribution of electrons. Even, even if the molecule is nonpolar. Now, if the molecule is nonpolar, it's nonpolar overall. But let's suppose we had a super fast nanosecond camera that could somehow, we could image a molecule and we could somehow take a, a picture of it. It's some instantaneous moment in time. Electrons might not be completely evenly distributed. Now, over time, they'll balance itself out. But at some moment in time, you might have a slight uneven distribution of electrons, in which case you would have an instantaneous dipole. This is a dipole that existed at some moment in time due to the uneven distribution of electrons, right? And so you have forces of attraction between dipoles, even instantaneous dipoles, all right? So these London forces are due to the forces of attraction between instantaneous dipoles. They exist in all molecules, polar versus nonpolar, but they're the primary force of attraction in nonpolar molecules, right? Because if you're nonpolar, you can't have ion dipole and you can't have dipole dipole. So this is really all you have for nonpolar molecules, okay? And so this increases with increasing number of electrons. So as the as you get to bigger and bigger atoms, 
that have more electrons, you're more likely to have that uneven distribution of electrons at any given time, right? So if you look at the halogens, if you look at the boiling point of the halogens, so if we look at the halogens, halogens as a group, you go from fluorine to chlorine to bromine to iodine. Let's look at the boiling points. 85 Kelvin for fluorine, 239 for chlorine, 333 for bromine, and 458 for iodine, right? So fluorine and chlorine are gases at room temperature. Bromine is a liquid, right? And iodine is a solid. Now, all these are nonpolar molecules, but your boiling point increasing because the London dispersion forces get bigger. You have a bigger, you have more, more electrons. Okay? And then last, last is hydrogen bonding. All right, so this occurs, this is really, this is a special case of dipole-dipole forces. Okay, so this occurs whenever there is hydrogen directly bonded to a highly electronegative element. Okay, so what's, what's, a, what's a, a highly electronegative element? One that really wants electrons. Electronegativity is the attraction for the electrons in a bond. Okay, when we say an, an, uh, uh, an element is highly electronegative, that means it, it, just, it, it will basically steal electrons away from whatever it's bonded to. And the three most electronegative elements are fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen. Fluorine is the highest, followed by oxygen, followed by nitrogen. Okay, so why is this why is this special? Why is the electronegative why is the electronegative electronegativity different special? Because the bigger the electronegativity difference, the bigger the partial charges, and the bigger the partial charges, the stronger will be your forces of attraction. So, like I said, this is a as a special case of dipole-dipole forces. This is, what this amounts to is, it's just really strong dipole-dipole forces. Okay, so this is usually reflected in increased melting and molding point. So for example, if we look at a group going down the oxygen group, oxygen to sulfur to selenium, Water boils at 373, hydrogen sulfide at 212, H2SE at 231, okay? This is out of line. And it's not that these are big, it's that this is, this is big, okay? This is actually much, much bigger than it really ought to be in the absence of the hydrogen bonding. If it wasn't for the hydrogen bonding, that boiling point would be down, it would be below 212 for sure, if it wasn't for the hydrogen bonding. It should be the smallest, it's really the biggest, because of the hydrogen bonding, okay? And one more time, your criteria for your hydrogen bonding is you have to have hydrogen directly bonded to an electronegative element. Directly bonded. In other words, somewhere in your molecule, there has to be an NH bond, an OH bond, or an FH bond. Okay, it's not enough that you have... Uh, nitrogen and hydrogen in the same molecule, there has to be an NH bond. All right. So let's look at some examples here. Let's look at some examples. All right. So um, let's look at ethyl alcohol versus dimethyl ether. Okay. Now, um, both of these molecules have the same chemical formula. You have the same number of atoms. Two carbons, two carbons, one, two, three, four, five, six hydrogens, six hydrogens. Okay. The difference is, I realize you guys haven't had organic and you don't know functional groups, but an OH group is what makes something an alcohol, and an ether is a COC group. So anyway, so we have the same number of atoms. Okay. Ethyl alcohol, which is green alcohol, drinking alcohol, has a boiling point of 
degrees Celsius. Okay, if we look at dimethyl ether. Okay, it's different. Boils at minus 23 Celsius. Big, big, big difference in boiling point. Why? Because this one can hydrogen bond and this one cannot. What? What do we got? We have an OH bond. Okay. Another example. If we look at acetic acid versus methyl formate. Okay. Acetic acid versus methyl formate. Acetic acid, same thing. These two have the same thing. These two have the same chemical formula. Two carbons. Let's see, one, two, three, four hydrogens and two oxygens. Okay. Acetic acid, which is the active component in vinegar, active ingredient in vinegar, vinegar is a solution of acetic acid, boils at 118 Celsius. Methyl formate boils at 32 Celsius. Okay. This can hydrogen bond, this cannot. Boiling point 118 versus boiling point 32, and there's your OH bond. Okay, we have an oxygen in this one as well, but you don't have an OH bond. So one more time, you have to have a hydrogen directly bonded to an oxygen. Why? So there's because there's a big electronegativity difference between those atoms. That bond is that bond is polar. Okay, this bond, these bonds are much more nonpolar. Okay. So that is, I, that is basically inner molecular forces and hydrogen bonding.